Threats, breaches and cybercrime could result in serious damage to industries, exposing very valuable information. We chat to Principal Forensic Scientist Jason Yordan, one of the speakers at My World of Tomorrow conference and exhibition. The Internet of Things is fundamentally changing the way the world is connected. If you look at the traditional internet, you had networks and devices connected to the internet and they were predominantly computing devices, servers, computers, laptops and now cell phones. The Internet of Things has fundamentally changed that dynamic because now so many devices can actually be connected to the internet from IP cameras, security cameras, fridges, TVs, Literally anything that you can imagine and conceive of can now be connected to the internet using the IPv6 addressing um, system. So what this does for us from a security point of view is it actually expands our threat surface significantly. Um, the number of potential vectors of attack have grown exponentially because of the potential number of devices that are now connected to the internet through the internet of things. So traditionally where we wanted to commit a cyber crime or some other kind of uh, security event, we would go via computers or we'd go via servers. Now nothing prohibits me from hacking into an IP camera and you know doing a bit of voyeuristic viewing of what you're doing and then posting those videos online or blackmailing you with it. So it fundamentally changes the way the world is going to work. So from a threat perspective, the number of threats that we're going to face is going to change. Um, it's going to increase. And I think also we can't at this stage even begin to imagine all of the potential threats that the Internet of Things will potentially bring us. Probably the most common one that we encounter to a large extent is still fraud committed via the internet. And, and the reason for this is because the internet kind of makes us gullible in a lot of respects. We see it posted online and we tend to believe it, you know, so it's just general manipulation. So fraud has existed sort of since the beginning of human recorded history and it will continue way after I'm dust and bones. And the internet just facilitates that process. So that's a very common uh, cyber threat in South Africa currently. Coming back to the other type of cyber crime which is very predominant and, and unfortunately you're not going to really read much about it is, is hacking and hacking is happening on a large scale in South Africa. It's very seldom reported. Uh, most organizations will be quite happy to deal with the hacking incident internally without reporting it to the police unless there's an absolute necessity to report it to the police. So. That's something we need to bear in mind that it's happening on an ongoing basis. So a lot of the threats that we face in South Africa in those environments are exactly the same threats that countries like the United States, um, that Europe will encounter, Australia, China, Japan, Brazil, very much the same threats. Um, I think where we differ slightly, and again that comes back to how we address crime in general, is that we might not have as much focus on addressing cybercrime in South Africa as there is in other, in other countries because obviously of the dynamics we have as a country. South African companies invest a lot in information security in general. But the information security landscape, not just in South Africa but internationally, is dominated by vendors and the vendors sell the latest widgets. The thing is that not a single one of these technologies actually means that you are 100% secure. But unfortunately boards and, and sort of boards of directors in organizations then be brought, are brought under a sense of security that, well, we have all of this technology, we've invested in it, so we must be secure. But the simple reality is, is there's not one single magic bullet, there's not one single technology that will make you entirely secure because if I'm a bad guy and I want to get inside your organization, I will find a way to do it. At, at the end of the day, cyber crime or any crime is committed by humans. It's, it's a people thing. Machines don't commit crimes. Technology doesn't commit crimes. People do. And you need to have a rational, thinking, skilled, knowledgeable human defender who can defend against those crimes. Somebody who can think on their feet, somebody who can react quickly in an agile environment to emerging threats and not be dependent on the technology. And I, I think that's something from a South African perspective and an international perspective we need to do. So do we invest in technology? Yes, we do. 
do we necessarily invest in our people as much as we should? No. And, and one of the reasons is a lot of the training in this domain is very expensive. We need to have good, skilled practitioners. And then I think we can actually start to win the war on cybercraft. The policy makers we tend to forget is civil society. So often we think about government as being the drivers of policy in any particular country. And we forget that as citizens of our country, we have a, a sort of a, a role to play in the development of policy ourselves. You know, government tends to take a, a top-down approach to policy, where civil society can take a bottoms-up approach to policy. And as civil society, we need to start informing the policy makers of the real threats and, and the real issues that need to be addressed. We as civil society need to address these issues with our own constituents. You know, we need to speak to the people we know, we need to get into the schools, we need to get into the universities, we need to start sensitizing people about the risks of cybersecurity. We need to realize that in the 21st century, our commodity, our value, is not the widgets we produce or the services that we offer or any of those type of things. The commodities that we need to protect is our information. Our information is the thing that has value in our organizations in the 21st century. And we put so much time and effort into protecting our buildings and our inventory and all of those type of things. And we don't put the same amount of effort and care into protecting the one thing that really gives us an advantage and that's our information. And I think that's from a corporate perspective, the policies that we need to traditionally or we need to seriously address.